We're back for the official Jets podcast. Eric Allen in the studio with Jets defense alignment Solomon Thomas. We're joined as always by the mad backer Bart Scott. This is a very special occasion, Solomon. World Mental Health Day. When you hear that phrase, what do you think of? Uh, when I think of World Mental Health Day, you know, I'm thinking about the recognition and, and acknowledgement of, you know, just mental health in general. Like, it's not something that we all used to talk about. It's something that's taken a lot of, um, you know, research, a lot of time, a lot of vulnerable stories from people to get to a point where we can talk about it and we can talk about it in, in the realness that it is, like how serious mental health is and how we're all inevitably going to inevitably going to be affected by mental health in our lifetime and how it's important to treat it as such as as you know treat it as uh, you know mental challenges and illnesses as you know a disease just like anything else and how you know it's people you know needing help and, and getting help and taking the courage and strength to do that and you know so when I hear World Mental Health Day it's I, I feel of you know all the people who've sacrificed and told their vulnerable stories and and came out and spoke um, and let them know like how much are struggling and you know how it's gotten us to this day where we're acknowledging mental health and I think it's huge. When you think about mental health and you know what it means to redefine what it means to be a man, you know especially from our perspective being professional mm-hmm. athletes, we we always project that we're Superman, but we spend a lot more time being Clark Kent than we do being Superman. So mm-hmm. kind of can you speak to like how the narrative may be changing in the locker room where men can feel like they can be vulnerable and really express, mm-hmm. you know, their their weaknesses or their concerns. And I don't even want to say weaknesses or mm-hmm. let's just say their vulnerabilities yeah. and where yeah. they're at in the mental space. And how has the locker room changed in the in the NFL as mm-hmm. a whole, you know, done when it comes to addressing mental health and, and allowing a safe space? Yeah, I think like you hit it on the head, like it's huge, like, you know, we spend more time being Clark Kent than we do, um, you know, Superman. And, you know, it's most importantly to acknowledge that we're human beings, that we can't always have this persona that we're gladiators, that we um, can tough everything out, that we can rub dirt on it. Like, hey, like, you know, we're human beings and, and we go through human emotions and feelings. Like, and as men, it's okay to feel those. It's okay to, you know, be sad. It's okay to be depressed. It's okay to be anxious. And we just have to find ways to, to cope with that and combat that and, and, and find ways to get better and get through it. And just understand as men that it's okay for us to talk it's okay for us to you know trust someone and have a safe place and be like hey I'm not doing well like and, and I need to talk to you or hey I'm not doing well do you know somewhere where I can maybe get help and to get through this hard time I'm going through you know we're not taught to deal with the ups and downs of life and the adversity and the emotions we're not given the language to describe it and there's so much pressure put on men to you know be you know just straight and, and, and tough and just to get through it um, you know but in the reality we're all going to go through you know the ups and downs and life and the the emotions we claim that are bad like you know being sad depressed you know awkward angry all those things and, and we didn't teach each other how to how to deal with them and so I think in the NFL locker room it's gotten a lot better and it's improved and um, you know guys are talking guys are telling their stories you know um, you know AJ Brown you know myself you know Darius Leonard um, Darren Walker you know Max Crosby there's so many names now that are speaking out and talking about mental health and the struggles that they've been through and it's really opened the floor for a lot of guys just to be human and take that step back and not be Superman for a moment and just be Clark Kent and be like, hey, you know, I'm human. This NFL life is a lot. There's a lot of pressures, a lot of expectations. And, you know, it's tough and, and, and I'm, I'm going through a hard time. You know, I think we've allowed and opened that space for players. I think that's been huge and I hope it saves lives and I hope it teaches, you know, us men that are in this like gladiator space to, you know, show other people like, hey, like, hey, we're in this big space and we're supposed to be big, strong, tough men, but we can be sensitive too and we can get help and we can go to therapy and we can meditate and we can journal and it's okay for us as men to do that and I hope we teach that to our sons and our teammates and our friends and I think that this space is really changing I think, and I hope it continues to change. Can you share your vulnerable story with us Mm -hmm. and our audience because four years ago your Mm -hmm. family's life changed forever. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll definitely share it. You know, uh, 2018, I lost my big sister Ella to suicide, and um, it completely threw and and shocked my family's world upside down. Like, uh, I didn't know much about mental health. You know, I I just lost my sister to suicide, and it was something that people didn't talk about. It was like this taboo thing that, like, you couldn't talk about. People would, you know, say sorry for your loss, but they wouldn't address how my sister Ella died. And, you know, it was you could feel the stigma around it. It was like, it was this burden. It was this, you know, this thing that you couldn't 
didn't really touch on, and you know, then that affected me personally with in my grief process of losing my sister. Um, you know, she's the most important person to me. We're extremely close. And I just lost her, and you know, you go through all the all the feelings of losing from someone by suicide, which is the guilt, the overthinking, you know, just and just missing them and, and being depressed and just, you know, missing that person. And you know, I was I was a third pick in the draft in 2017, <clears throat> and I was going through pressures of you know not performing and and, and all this stuff and. I felt like I couldn't come out and talk about my sister or my own struggles because I felt like people would th say that I'm using that as, a, as an excuse and I'm being weak. And so I suppressed my emotions. I didn't talk about how how hard I was, how hard the life I was living, how, how dark it was or how much I needed help. And I wouldn't get help and I kept suppressing them and I got to a really dark place where I didn't wanna, really wanna be here anymore. It was hard to wake up, it was hard to go to work, it was hard to hard to see the light in the day. Like I was just really struggling. And then, you know, I was approached by my boss at the time, John Lynch, and gave me that permission to get help. And, you know, I finally started getting help. I learned how to cope with my emotions. I learned how to, um, you know, handle them in certain ways or and, and to honor my anger and to honor my sadness and honor my depression. And, and you know, I learned different coping mechanisms, whether it was meditation or journaling or, you know, just having a safe place and talking to someone. And, you know, I, I was just thrown in this world of mental health and, and I got a lot better. And, and you know, I just, I just learned from it. And, and I took my experience and now I try to go talk about my own journey, my sister's journey and what I've learned about mental health to everyone you know I want to I want to make make sure people know it's okay not to be okay like it's okay to be angry it's okay to be sad it's okay to be depressed like you're not broken like things will get better and there's help out there and you know the strength isn't in being silent the strength isn't in like toughing things out the strength isn't being vulnerable the strength is in talking and asking to get help because that takes way more courage and strength than it is to be silent and to act like everything's okay um, you know I'm just trying to go out there and, and let people know that so they can be free and they can get help and they can they can um, you know take steps into getting better when, when you think about you know you've been on both sides of it right you lost a loved one to suicide and you contemplated yourself you know a lot of times you know we, we put a lot of guilt on ourselves i've lost a a close friend or close loved one to suicide as well and you feel like you had you didn't recognize the signs or the or the signals of how did you miss it right so when you think about you know when you do wellness checks on your friends you know, what are some things that you think you should do as far as when you ask them if they're okay how, how deep mm -hmm. should you pry and you know also could you just speak on some you know some tools that you can use some services that you can mm -hmm. reach out to if mm -hmm. you if you may not have the just in case or some mechanism just in case mm -hmm. people that are watching this don't have the strength to check themselves in and talk to a professional but maybe they can take some type of Tool that you have, whether it's meditation, and be able to apply that to their lives, and maybe mm -hmm. you know build up the strength and the courage to one day you know call someone. Definitely, yeah, and and you know personally, like I, I text, I have a few group uh, group chats with my friends from college and high school, and like maybe once every month, once every two months, I'll just send, hey, mental health check. Like, you don't have to talk in the chat, you can text me individually, you can text anyone individually. I'm just opening the space for you to say something and talk. And, um, you know, that's one way I do it, but just a day to day, just when you're asking someone how they're doing, like mean it, like and follow up with the question, like how are you doing? Like they'll might give you just a good or fine or whatever, but it'll be like, how are you doing really? And like try to just like see like you know if they're struggling or if if everything's okay, they, they might be fine. But if they're not okay, just be like, hey, I may not know what to say to whatever is going on in your life, but I'm here to listen and I'm here to just be here for you and be a safe place. Like those small conversations can really save someone's life and they can really change change how someone's feeling and, and let someone know that hey, I don't feel alone right now. I feel like I can talk to someone. I feel like I can, maybe this encouraged me to get help. Maybe this encouraged me to open up. Um, but yeah, like there's, uh, I think a new service that just happened that's it's amazing is the 988 uh, suicide, uh, prevent national suicide uh, hotline now. Um, it's like a 911, but for mental health. And you, I would say that's that's amazing crisis situations where, you know, you're really worried about a loved one and or, or a friend or even someone you just met, but like, you know that, hey, this is a situation that's very serious. We need to attend to it right now. Now the new 988, uh, um, hotline is, is unbelievable and, and it's great that you know we finally got that passed um, but also like for meditation I use something called Headspace you know guided meditation mm -hmm. um, it just you know I, I'm a guy who's always my life's always busy it's always on the go it's always intense and to get out of that, I just meditate so I can just slow down and be present and be be wherever I am at the time and just like let life calm down a little bit. Um, you know, like I said, journaling is always great. You know, I'm an overthinker. I like to get my thoughts out of my head on a paper. Um, but, you know, besides that, you know, just like 
I think therapy is a great tool. Um, you know, there's a lot of different like resources for it, um, but I think therapy is just you know a great way to teach us how to deal with our emotions, a great way to teach us how to cope, a great way to where we can just talk and it's not a reactionary resource to use. It's a preventinary. It's like you should use therapy to to just to make sure you're in check with yourself. You know what's going on with yourself. You know how to deal with yourself. You can just talk about life like like you know. It's essentially like having a life coach, um, and then you can just use that and, and just be be fresh and free from a day to day basis. Or yeah. What do you want people to know about your sister Ella? Um, mm -hmm. I have two sisters. Reading over your story and how close you were, it is so incredibly heartbreaking. But also, what do you want to do with your life in her mm -hmm. honor? Yeah, um, you know, my sister, you know, she's someone who lit up a room. Like, she came in, laughed, smiled, and she lit up the room. And she just made everyone feel so important. Like, you could be in a room with 100 people, but you were in the room with Ella, um, and you were talking to her. She made you feel like you were the only person in that room. She made you feel and she made you feel important. She made, she validated your feelings and emotions. And I just want to bring that to people. I want to make sure people, like, when I'm with them, I want to be present with them. I want to show them that, that they are important. This is, this is anyone else. Um, you want to make sure just people feel that validation around them. Um, you know, and my sister was was ahead of her time. Like, when people asked her how she was doing, she would tell them. She would be like, hey, like, I'm pretty anxious right now, and I'm, I'm having a bad day. And back when she used to do that, like, people really didn't know how to react. They'd be like, whoa, like, they would kind of push back from her because, you know, they felt like, you know, she was giving them a burden. But she she wasn't asking them to feel bad for her. She wasn't asking them. She was just telling them how, how she was doing. And I think, you know, that's something we need to do more in the society is, like, when we're not doing okay, like, letting people know and having that strength and vulnerability that my sister had. And, you know, I just want to share her story. I want to live the way she lived by making people feel important, by just, you know, being present in every every day-to-day -day life and, and fighting like she did. You know, she she struggled with anxiety and depression. She was diagnosed with both. And, you know, she came out and she fought every day. Um, and, you know, she fought till the end. And, you know, I miss her every day. But, you know, I want to keep living for her and keep, keep changing lives for her. I'll, I'll tell you what. Uh, what she went through in college, nobody ever should have to go through. Um, how much do you and your family still talk about her situation how she tried to deal with it and then also how much do you guys work together for each other mm -hmm. yeah um you know we talk about her situation like kind of kind of more in these situations when you know we're talking to people and we're sharing like you know about like her anxiety and depression and how it all started coming together and, and we learned about it through her life and we learned how to deal with it and um and just like you know things we could have done better things we learned after she passed away and um you know all that kind of stuff uh um uh but what was the second half of the question it was well how how much do you guys continually uh, be mm. there for each other oh, in yeah, terms yeah, of a yeah. support system because uh, i think your life will never be the same mm -hmm, yeah but yeah. you have to find a way to live Definitely, yeah, yeah. No, like our life is forever changed, and we'll forever be missing Ella, and, and forever have that hole of just missing Ella. But you know, we've we've learned how to. When, when Ella first died, we didn't know how to cry in front of each other because we knew how, we knew how much I knew how much my mom was struggling. I knew how much my dad was hurting. I knew how much myself was hurting too, and I didn't want to make them feel any more hurt than they already were feeling. And so we we were afraid to cry in front of each other. Um, and then we learned how to do that. Um, you know, I don't know what, I, there was one instance that, you know, that we all, all, we all think set it off, but after we learned how to cry together, like, we learned how to ask each other how you're doing. We learned how to, like, you know, really just incorporate, like, you know, those checkups and, like, being, like, because when I would cry with my mom about it or cry with my dad about it, we all felt better because we all were, were releasing these emotions and, and releasing these feelings about missing Ella. And we all felt the same way about it. We were hurting. We were, we were depressed about it. We were struggling with, with missing her. Um, and so it it wasn't, like, just a, from the jump, we weren't just all on top of that, but then we learned through the process of in our all, in all of our own struggles against mental health to, to be there for each other and check up on each other. And now we have a foundation together and, and, you know, we're constantly checking up on each other and we're constantly like, cause this work is not easy. It's hard work. And, and, you know, it's hard to always be vulnerable and talk about, you know, the hard things going on in your life. Um, and so we constantly have to check up on each other and like, Hey, like we're going around talking about Ella's story and some days it's harder than others talking about Ella. Some days, you know, it's, it's a little easier, but, um, you know, we've learned how to be there for each other and be a good support system for each other. Can you talk about the foundation? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, my family, 
my mom, dad, my cousin Ray, and myself, we started the Foundation of the Defensive Line, where our mission is to end the epidemic of youth suicide, especially for young people of color, um, by transforming uh, the way we connect and communicate over mental health. And so what we're doing is we're going into schools, businesses, sports programs, and we, we have these programs where we're teaching any mentor of youth or any mentor of like a coworker or, or a teammate, and we're teaching them how to uh, have a better mental health environment, how to have the language to talk about mental health, how to address warning signs about mental health or when someone's struggling, how, what to do in crisis situations. Um, and we're just, we're, we're teaching them, you know, these things because they're, they're not something that, you know, they have to go through or they have to learn, but they need to learn because everyone's going to struggle and especially in these groups in schools and sports programs, there's pressure, there's anxiety, there's, there's expectations and people are going to struggle and we need to learn how to make make a way for everyone to have a safe place and, and feel free. Um, we've been going around, we, you know, I, we've spoken at Stanford University, um, uh, at their football program, we've spoken at Baylor to all the student athletes. My, you know, my parents have gotten to Dayton, Ohio. We've, we're going all over, and we're going in in, in high schools. We're going in, um, you know, we've done MGM in Vegas. Mm-hmm. You know, and we're just trying to continue to just change the narrative of mental health and have this education so people have, you know, a plan when something goes wrong in a classroom or, or at work and they know what to say to someone and they know how to address it or they know what to do when something goes really wrong and it's a crisis situation. And so that's what we've been doing and, and we're, we're excited about the work and we want to continue doing it and continue to change the world and save lives. When you talk about, you know, mental health and you talk about how can we, you know, take it to the next level, I think, you know, it's not as taboo as it used to be. You know, I have a niece that's bipolar. Uh, you talk about the youth and, you know, since the, you know, the boom of social media, we've seen more children create, you know, committing suicide, some, you know, on, you know, Facebook and, you know, digital platforms. You know, how important is it that we get into the elementary schools and give these kids a opportunity? Because you talk about cyber bullying mm-hmm. and it may not seem mm-hmm. like it's something that, it's too tough for us, but, you know, we're losing children because of cyberbullying and, you know, things happening on the Internet. How do we, one, like, you know, what, what, what can we do from a government program funding type of um, angle to be able mm-hmm. to get into some of these schools and do some early prevention mm-hmm. on the bullying aspect, but also on the mental aspect for kids that are not, you know, hit their teenage years? Yeah, and, and I don't have the perfect answer to the question, but, you know, I think it's, funding is a huge thing. You know, have more funding for mental health programs in schools, whether that's having, you know, uh, you know, like, like we have a team clinician here or like having something like that at schools or, um, you know, having, you know, more staff members for mental health situations on schools or, you know, having more programming like, you know, the defensive line's doing and just having that be a requirement or part of the curriculum to make sure that, hey, teachers, janitors, you know, coaches, principles they all have to go through it so they all can you know handle these situations and and create a better mental health environment for the elementary school kids or for the middle school kids or the high school kids um you know and you hit a lot of hard things like social media has been hard it's really hard on our kids there's there's so much out there and 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 like the cyber bullying is crazy and um you know it's definitely something that needs to be addressed and you know there needs to be more more rules and regulations on that as well you know we need to protect our kids and um you know save them from you know some of the things that are going on solomon part always talks about how you guys are a small fraternity Mm -hmm. not a lot of people play in the national football league how much have you been embraced by your brothers by coming out and sharing your story and your vulnerabilities and talking about your sister and what your family has dealt with and continues to deal with Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've gotten uh, some amazing support from, you know, my NFL brothers. You know, back in San Fran when I first started speaking, you know, my teammates there, they loved on me a lot. Um, you know, when I wrote a letter or wrote an article, they would they would come and say, hey, like, you know, they let me know that they read it or, or say, like, hey, I'm here for you, dog. Like, how you doing? Like, that kind of stuff. And that carried on to Vegas. Like, I had a lot of, lot of like, cool mental health situations and connections in Vegas with teammates, you know. Um, teammates asking, like, hey, where do I get help? Or teammates talking, talking to me about my story, like, how did you get help? Or, like, that kind of stuff and you know it's been really cool to see like each place I've gone I've had different situations where you know guys have been vulnerable with me and or they know my story so they are vulnerable with me and, and I'm vulnerable back and like we have this this cool connection I think you know the fraternity is is has had my back and I want to have theirs so I want to continue to you know preach this because I know they might not may not be going through it right now but at some point in their life they will so I want to make sure they have the the knowledge and, and the resources to 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 handle the situations when they come. If you could talk to to Demore Smith, and you know, I know, like right now, 
we get like eight, I believe, eight free sessions with a therapist that, you know, our insurance through Cigna will pay for. Mm -hmm. You know, if you could talk to uh, the Moore Smith, you know, John Abraham came out about his mental health struggles, I believe, a week or so. He made those public. Uh, if you could talk to the Moore Smith, what would you tell him is needed for current players and, and, and post players to make sure that we don't have any stories um, like Junior Seau continue to repeat mm -hmm. themselves in our fraternity? Yeah, you know, it, it's been it's been a devastating offseason the last this last year in the NFL. You know, we've lost. You know, it's not just been by suicide, but it's been by a lot of, you know, a lot a lot of different ways of death. And and it's been I think we had like it was three current players and, and maybe five five former players I knew about that I saw in the headlines this offseason. Um, and I think, you know, we talk about the eight free sessions, but I think I think we need more than that. I think we need more than eight free sessions. We need, um, you know, a stable therapist. You know, we're moving around so much. We can't – we have to change therapists when we're in different states. So, you know, whether it's, you know, different – you know, online therapy where we can, you know, have a current therapist wherever we go. Um, but also just like, you know, uh, constant check-ins. Like, you know, we're, we have to move teams, we have to move cities, we have to move our family. You know, it, 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 it's really hard and the pressure adds up and the stress adds up. So, you know, more check-ins or more – more kind of mental health help and, and have it more present in the building. I think I think that's huge. Um, but yeah, it's, I definitely think you know, encouraging guys to talk and letting the guys know the resources we have available and and having more resources available and, and more sessions available too. I think that's a huge thing to do. How old are you right now? I'm 27. Yeah. See, 27, and you've already played with three professional teams, mm -hmm. and you're talking about moves. Yeah. And people don't even think about this. This is one thing Barton and I have always mm -hmm. talked about throughout the years. Is that a lot of fans look at you on Sunday and say these guys are robots, you know, mm. and they just the jerseys change and we'll rotate them through. But you guys deal with a lot of things mm. just like anybody does. You yeah. got to find the proper doctor, you got to find the proper schools uh, if you have kids, um, and you get uprooted quite a bit mm. in your professional lives. Yeah, you know, you have to move with a drop of a dime, like whether you're traded, whether you're released, whether you sign with a different team in the offseason, like you have to move your family, move move all your stuff. It's it's a hard process, like, you know, and, and make new friends, and maybe you don't know if the new friends are even going to be here. Like, it's it's a constant kind of stress that goes on when you're moving teams, but yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it can be tough. Yeah, it, it, it's a lot, especially if you're dealing with mm -hmm. uh, things in terms of vulnerabilities that, that we're yeah. discussing because you guys have lives that we don't see. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot that happens uh, in the background that doesn't happen on Sunday that people don't see, for sure. Uh, how much did Robert Sala help you out when you were going through some struggles in San Francisco when this all, was all mm -hmm. always going down? Because the thing that has always struck me about Sala is – he has the ability to connect with human beings. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, Sal's always had my back. You know, after my sister died, he, he reached out to me, let me know that he was here for me and that he's so sorry about my loss. And, you know, he's always, you know, just kind of been a, been a good human being for me. You know, he's, he's always had my back. He's always, you know, been open to me and, and talked to me about that. You know, I, I'm very thankful for him. And our time in San Fran, when I went through that, that hard time, um, you know, they came out and supported me at my sister, sister's funeral, like, which was huge. Um, you know, it was a... Uh, you know, the Niners and, and Salah have been great to me, for sure, during that time. Well, we salute you for everything you're doing and you're going to do in the future. Uh, since we have you just for a couple minutes, can we ask a couple football questions? Of course, of course. Well, what right. do you think? Three and two yeah. after five games with your new team? Yeah, feeling great. You know, you know, obviously you feel great after victory Monday, um, you know, but we, we obviously have a lot of things to work on. But, um, you know, I'm excited about this group. We're hungry, we're talented, and we're putting things together. And, you know, we keep learning how to win, and we, we keep winning this way. I, th I think, you know, we're destined for great things. You know, I'm, I'm a huge believer in this group, and I'm really excited about this group. You know, I came out to uh, San Fran do a financial literacy program for the rookies. And at that time, you guys were one of the youngest teams in the NFL. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of those players were the foundation of what the San Francisco 49ers are today. Uh, when you look at the impact of these young rookie players or these first and second year players, whether it's Bear Tucker, Brees Hall, um, Sauce Gardner, um, what, what do you think about their performance and their maturity so early on in their career and how good they are, how good they can be? 
Yeah, uh, they're not playing like rookies. <laughs> you know, it's 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 been fun to watch them. Like ABT, put him at guard, put him at tackle. Like that man is balling. You know, Brees is out there. You know, Brees the beast is he's being the beast right now. It's been <laughs> it's been fun to watch. And you know, Sauce is he doesn't they don't they just don't look like rookies. Like the way they approach a game, like they're they're professionals and and they're detailed and they're talented and they're they're putting their talent to use. Like they're not afraid of the big NFL. They're coming out and they're playing ball right away. And it's been it's been really fun to watch. How cool is that to be part of a build? Because you were part of that in San Francisco, so mm-hmm. you're one of the guys in a locker room who can say, you know what, I've seen how this works before, mm-hmm. and you've been talking to the media a number of times here over the last couple of weeks, and you're saying, hey, I, I see where this is going. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, see, I see the way this team works. I see how hungry we are, and the biggest thing is, is, is believe in how great we are, and I think these wins have, have had us believe, like, hey, this team – is great and we can be great and we can continue to be great if we keep focusing on the details, if we keep staying together and, and being present week to week and not getting up or down with the win or a loss, just staying steady through through whatever it is and, and making sure that, hey, we're consistent with our work ethic, we're consistent with our grind, we're consistent with our details. And, you know, we once we put that together, I, I, I can see what this team can do and, you know, I, and I'm excited for it. Sala was real charged up in that locker room last night, but yeah. one of the things – that he said was, hey, we can celebrate, mm-hmm. but you got to get used to this. Yeah. This is the new normal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. When he said make this normal, like, you know, we're all like, yeah, like, heck yeah. Like, this This is a new, this is a new Jets. This is how we're going to rock. Like, make it normal to come in, come in on a Sunday, dominate, win, and just get back to work. You know, it's not a, it's obviously you celebrate every win in the NFL because they're hard to get. But it's not some Super Bowl celebration. It's like, hey, you know, we got this win. We expected to get this win. Back to work and get another one next week. What's Quinn and Williams ceiling? Oh, that man, he is dominating at another level right now. Like, he just can't be blocked. He's too strong. He's too powerful. He's too fast. You know, I, I said last week, I, I believe, like, he puts it together. He can be a defensive MVP. Um, you know, he is he is a, a force to be reckoned with. You know, he's he's uh, he's been fun to watch, a fun teammate to have. You know, Q is, Q is playing lights out right now. Is it special for you what's on the horizon going to the football cathedral that is Green Bay? It is, yeah. You know, it's always fun to go play in Lambeau. You know, it's everyone always asks my favorite place to play. It's always it's there. You know, yeah, I, yeah. I played there. I, I played there once, and it was just a fun, fun place to be. You know, it's cold. You know, it's got great history. It's the only thing in that town. Um, you know, you definitely love playing there. So I'm excited to go play there. What about? When you think about that. What's some of the things you want to share with your teammates as far as the environment, the feel? You know, they got the heated coils right because it mm-hmm. used to freeze. What what's some of the things that you'll share with them early on as far as environment so they can know what they're walking into? Because a lot of these guys have never played in Lambo. Yeah, no, I'll let them know that hey, they the they have a pretty good field. Like I think it's half turf, half grass. Um, you know, it's heated, you know, it's it, the field's actually pretty decent, but you know, it's it's like a college atmosphere, I'll let them know. Like it's the crowd gets rowdy, you know, I let them know about the hotel for sure, you know, the away <laughs> hotel that we normally stay in, like has has t- the some of the worst hotel beds that you know you'll sleep in. So, you know, just get get your sleep sleep leading up to the game before we leave on Saturday. So I think that's a huge thing to tell them as well. Um, but you know, and you know, the food's not great either, but you know, it's a you know, you're in you're in uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin. There's not much there. So cheese curds. Yeah, 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 exactly. You gotta get some cheese curds, but you know, you gotta um you gotta just get, be prepared for all that for sure. Uh, what about the opportunity playing against Aaron Rodgers? You, you never mm-hmm. know when y- your last crack at him is gonna be. Definitely, yeah. You know, he, it's a it's always fun to play against like a future Hall of Famer, and and you know, so Aaron's a guy who's always prepared. He he can change a game at any time time during the game. You know, he he knows how to get the offsides penalties and go downfield. Like he he's a very very good quarterback. So it's always fun to play against a future Hall of Famer and get a chance to get after him. So. Um, I know, I know we're excited. Solomon, thanks for stopping by the studio today. Thank you. I appreciate y'all. WinBet is bringing the excitement of Win Las Vegas to online sports betting and casino play. Get in on all your favorite teams, players, and sports. From boosted parlays to live in-game odds on every major sport, they have what you need to win. Jets fans in New Jersey, sign up today and use promo code XJETS. And after placing your first $100 wager, you will receive $100 to bet with. You will receive a $50 free bet and a $50 casino bonus. Again, the promo code is XJETS. 
Offer subject to change. Offer only available in New Jersey. Terms and conditions apply. You must be 21 or older to participate. Please visit winbet.com to view welcome offers available in Arizona, Colorado, Indiana, Louisiana, Michigan, New York, Tennessee, and Virginia. The official Jets podcast is presented by WinBet. Betting is a team sport. Bet together at WinBet. Eric Allen with Bart Scott, as always. What can you say about the work Solomon Thomas is doing, Bart? I mean, it's, it's important work, right? I mean, like I said, we had John Abraham come out, talk about his struggles. And it's a lot of guys that, that suffer in silence. And the more and more we don't make this such, you know, so taboo, right, we'll be able to have guys open up and we can save some lives and also influence other people who look up to NFL players to be able to say, hey, if we, they can be vulnerable, if they can go get the help that they need, then so can I, right? So it's about saving lives. And if you change one, you've done a life's work, right? And that's really what it's all about. And, you know, the NFL has always been on the forefront, whether it was attacking cancer and, you know, making October and everybody wearing pink and bringing awareness and resources. You know, I think we should also do the same with mental health. And so far, so good. Long way to go. But, you know, the work that he's doing is important. Yeah, it's huge. And he's a guy we will continue to root for because he is making inroads, not just on the football field, but well off of it. So uh, we salute him and his family. Let's talk about the Jets. Three and two after five games. How yeah. about this stat for you? Zach Wilson has had six drives in the fourth quarter in two games, five touchdowns and one kneel down. Yeah, man. You know, it's like what they say when, when it's, when it's, too hard for everybody else is just right for us. And listen, you would you would hope that they wouldn't allow Miami to come back and go 17-19. But I tell you what, did they answer and did they answer in, in a great way? You talk about, you know, locking in, getting her done, turning the ball over. And I thought it was very symbolic that um, you know, Quentin Williams threw Tyreek Hill, <laughs> who shunned the Jets out of the club like Jazzy Jeff, you know, getting thrown out the the house by my Uncle Phil, but for hitting on Hillary. So I'm glad that he was able to get it. And I told you guys last week, I like my fillet. I like my fish fillet with sauce and sauce garden. How, how crazy is this? Yeah. You know, the Jets <laughs> could dominate the month with rookie offensive players and defensive players of the year uh, of the week. Yep. Because if you look at it this week, Brees Hall should win it again. And he should be off the AFC offensive player. We got no Gabe Davis went for 171, but he went for, you know, 197, you know, against, uh, you know, a team that was uh, four and one at the time or three and one, whatever their record was. And they got the job done in an upset fashion. And then Sauce, you know, got a safety, got a sack, a safety and an interception. He, he should have won the award again this week as well. So, I mean, how great is that? It just speaks to the young talent and the great job that Joe Douglas has done and the coaching staff has done to put these guys in positions to really, really put their, their talents in, on, on display. How great is the official Jets podcast where Bart Scott throws a fresh Prince of Bel Air reference at you? I love that. Do you think there should be two championship belts in terms of rookies of the week? Because – like you just mentioned, you got Brees Hall, but you got Sauce Gardner. Either you got to cut that belt, uh, belt in half or give them each you're good, about. You're good because one is offensive and one is defensive. So they've got it one after the other. Garrett got it, then Sauce got it, then Brees got it. But how about having a week where they both get one, right, offense and defense the same week? That would be crazy, right? And that just speaks to where they're going, you know what I mean, and, and what Brees Hall is. I told people before, and I said again, I said that Brees Hall was going to be everything that Saquon Barkley was supposed to be. Uh, not not shunning not shunning Saquon Barkley, just speaking to the talent because I don't think we had enough of the hoopla that that Saquon got because he was taken second overall. But I think when you look at the results, what Saquon Barkley did his rookie year, eighteen hundred yards, I believe, a total offense. You know, between the run and pass, I think Brees is on pace to be able to finish strong and be able to top those numbers but also just his physicality and hopefully he can stay healthy, but so far so good. And I think we should put, you know, we should have more hoopla about how excited jet fans should be when they were able to move up and get him in the second round. I think Joe Douglas should be executive of the year in the national football league. I think that's the way it's going to play out. We'll have to see. You're talking about this rookie class, but how about these free agents making a difference? Like they aforementioned DJ Reed, yeah. uh, Elijah Vera Tucker, obviously was a draft pick last year, but he's everything that they're trying to instill in terms of the culture here. Guy lines up everywhere. Next week will probably be playing center or fullback. Yeah. Um, but long, long snapper. yeah, yeah. Long snapper. I mean, but uh, as far as this draft is concerned, the 2022 draft class, yeah, 
It, you should throw the special name by it because it does have an opportunity to be special and pay dividends for not just this year, not five years down the road, but oh, wow, uh, the potential uh, of the Jets' young core is really something yep. else. Who's more of a surprise? The Jets at three and two, considering who they played, and then yep. starting a backup quarterback the first three games of the season, even though he's an accomplished player in Joe Flacco, or the New York Giants at four and one. I mean, for, for me, the New York Giants is a different story. I think that you have to go with the Jets because of the expectation was a little lower. Um, the, the Giants had their quarterback in place for a long time. They had, you know, first round draft picks as well. But, you know, also they had they had spent the, the crazy money in free agency when they went out and they spent a lot of money on Sterling, paid Sterling Shepard, paid Kenny, brought Kenny Galladay in, made the trade for Leonard Williams. So they're deep in their process. Right. So they're starting to evaluate and see who's going to be there for the long term. But they've already had an initial core and an initial foundation. Now, you know, you talk about, you know, Brad Berry that they brought in when they spent so much money in crazy. The Jets are different because they still have plenty of draft equity. Yep. They still have plenty of draft capital or salary cap capital as well. When you think about this offseason, they're, they're going to have probably, you know, fifth, sixth most salary cap space than anybody in the league. And that's. That's a testament to Joe Douglas building a young foundation and doing it organically and not doing it through free agency, which is only temporary. If you want to have long, sustained success, you have to build it through the draft. No, but when he's had to go to free agency, I mean, he's getting returns. We saw Dwayne Brown come back to the lineup here this week for the Jets. Uh, Conklin has caught a number of balls from both quarterbacks. All right. So what do you make of the Green Bay Packers right now? Three and two overall. That technically was a home game in London, but they are 2-0 and at Lambeau Field this year. What do you think about the matchup ahead for the Jets on the horizon? Well, I, I get some type of conf- confidence because they went in to – listen, I understand Lambeau is a historical place, but it's no more special than playing in Pittsburgh. I know it's not the old Heinz Field or it's not the Three Rivers Stadium, but it is Pittsburgh, and it's that tradition when you think about, you know – um, heritage brands or legacy brands, you would go the Stillers, you would go the uh, Giants, you would go uh, the, the the Packers as well. So the fact that they played in a tough environment when Renegade comes on down 10 and was able to come back, the fact that they were able to go to Cleveland with another one of those, you know, heritage legacy environments. So I don't think the environment would be anything that they didn't face in Pittsburgh and, and, and Cleveland. And I think this would be a great opportunity for them to use some of that experience that they gained to go in a hostile environment, a college-like atmosphere, and be able to really have a great showing for themselves and understand and believe that this isn't the Green Bay Packers of old. This isn't the uh, Aaron Rodgers, Devontae Adams, that they're a very beatable team, but you have to believe that before we can. Yeah, so how do you think they match up on both sides of the ball? Let's start right there with the the defense going against Rodgers, who is adjusting right now. They're running a football well. Aaron Jones wants the ball more. (laughs) Well, I think that's where he's going to be. If it was one thing that the Jets have to do better, they have to tackle. Sauce has to get his head across. You can't put an arm out there and think you're going to get somebody at the bounce. You got to put the the, the 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 far leg in front, and you got to put the head across to be able to get guys out. You know, they gave up some runs to 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 uh, Brita running laterally, right? He was going. Oh no, Mustard. I'm sorry. Raheem Mustard. Yep. Yeah, yeah, Mustard. I always, you know, Brita's in uh, with the uh, Giants. But, you know, running laterally. So those jet sweeps are things and personnel groups that they use. You know, you hear Brees Hall talking about how difficult it is for teams to adjust to their two line running back set. Well, they gonna, the Jets defense going to have to have an answer for that because when Dylan and, and, and Aaron Jones is in the same game, you're going to get those jet sweeps, you know, with downhill runs as well, trying to grab your eyes and get you to expand just slightly or – you know, try and get you to stay inside with the inside run and give it to Aaron Jones to hit the corners. Right now, his favorite target is Aaron is, is Randall Cobb, you know, somebody that he fought hard for to come. That's somebody that he truly trusts. But it's going to be exciting to see how we match up because they don't really have a dominant Tyreek Hill or Jalen Waddle. What they do is they have a guy who knows how to facilitate the football and get the football to the playmakers. You know, they just haven't been doing a good job in being able to catch the ball. But Aaron Rodgers can, you know, in a week, things can change. You know, when they drop those balls, that now they can catch them and it's going to put you in distress. So you got to be on your A game. You got to be able to pay attention to the little things because Aaron Rodgers is a master of the of the little things, right? That's how you measure good to great. 
doing the little things on a consistent basis. They got to make sure that, hey, when it's time to change personnel, you get off the field. He's going to try and get free plays by getting you 12 men on the field. He's going to have fluctuations in his in his in his cadence. Yep. You got to pay attention to the little things. So the little things add up to big things because they're the difference between winning and losing. They're just going to have to be really locked in in the environment and make sure that they play a solid game with no turnovers. What about on the other side of the ball? The Packers pass defense ranks second in the National Football League. I know the Giants had a lot of traction in the second half over across the pond. Uh, What do you think about the matchup for Zach Wilson and company? Five rush touchdowns against the Miami Dolphins. And I love the run-to-pass ratio because they said, Zach Wilson – you don't have to do it all yourself. 33 carries Great. on the ground, 21 pass attempts. But what do you have to do against the Packers? Because I look at them and say, hey, on the edges, they can bring the heat. And I also like the interior of that defensive line. Well, but they, they also give up huge rushing yards. You see Saquon. You see also using the, the running backs in the passing game. You know, Saquon coming across the middle and being able to outrun the defense, clearing the linebackers. You know, I think you can attack these linebackers. They have young linebackers and Quay, Quay Walker. And, you know, Campbell is a, uh, a pro bowler, and he's a franchise type of defensive player. But I like our matchups and our running backs being able to have choice and option routes against them. Also, I like the fact that, you know, we can run the ball downhill on them. They're, they're a good team. They're physical. They're fast. But they don't stop the run particularly well. So I look forward to running the ball and making sure that you maintain that balance. You know, minimum 30, 30 carries and, you know, be able to take shots when they come down and get greedy into into the pocket. Yeah, I really like that. And let's end here. What do you think about this two-game swing? I think before the season, even the most internal optimists from a Jets perspective were like, well, I don't know if we're going to come away with a win here, Green Bay at Denver. But you look at the Packers, you look at the Broncos, I see two teams still trying to find themselves. Uh, right. I, I would say Green Bay is more advanced than Den- uh, Denver at this point. But the Jets are playing well right now. Yeah, it's not who you play, it's when you play them, right? And it's about, you know, the Jets, you know, play some tough teams in Baltimore and, and Cincinnati early on. I think if they can have those games back, they'll be a, a lot more competitive. But when you think about it, right, you know, it's like who who can get their identity? I think, you know, early on, you know, they, they were finding their identity under Joe Flacco. But now with two games on this belt and Zach Wilson, they know who they can be. They know how to block. You know, Dwayne Brown came back and, you know, who knows? Eventually this team is going to get uh, Noah Fant together. Then you're going to have, you know, something that you thought you were going to have at the beginning of the year and protection to be better. You'll be able to take more shots and you'll be able to do more things. Thanks, brother. Uncle Phil would have liked this podcast. <laughs> 